Okay, this is a walkthrough of practice test three, the final test for the course. Um, the review sheet for the test has been posted in unit, uh, in module 10, uh, and this basically is covering modules 10 through 15. There's not much material in there besides what is in the uh, reading, the main reading by Desmond. So um, for the most part, what you just need to be doing is reading Desmond and taking good notes. The one exception is that I'm going back to some stuff from um, module two about some basic ideas and critical thinking and argument, which actually you know come up all the time. I didn't have separate test questions on the, for them for, um, test two, but I did for test one and they'll be back and they're back again in test three. Um, so here's actually, let's just go over and look at the review sheet. So uh, I've broken it up into four pools. Uh, the first pool is about uh, the people and their stories. And so again, we just want to know what winds up happening with different characters. Uh, and I listed uh, six of them here, Lorraine, Lamar, Arlene, Scott, and then the Hingstons. Um, uh, so there'll be one question pulled, uh, pulled from this pool. And then there are going to be five questions uh, about uh, the information and arguments from evicted. That is information about housing um, and the sociology and economics of housing, along with the arguments that Desmond gives at the end for um, some of his important claims, including the idea that there should be a universal housing voucher, right? And then, so if you scroll down on this, you've got some critical thinking terms. This is the stuff that I just pulled over from review sheet um, one. Uh, everything in philosophy, whenever we talk about what we're doing, we frame it in terms of argument. So some, these are some basic ideas about argument, uh, the idea of argument itself, premise, standard form, conclusion, statement, that sort of thing. I'll talk more about these when we get to the questions. And then the last bit um, are, is the one new piece of material I have in modules 10 through 15 that's not in Desmond is a video that I presented on a theory of exploitation from a philosopher named Alan Wertheimer. All right, again, we'll talk about these as we go along. All right, so let's just take a look at the uh, practice test. So what happens to the Hingstons? Um, actually, the Hingstons have one of the uh, few happy endings. They finally moved to Brownsville um, and found a nice three bedroom place and Patrice earns her GED. Um, this is outlined in um, the very last part of the book, I believe, in about this book. Okay, so that's that's our one question about the characters and what happens to them. Um, the next five questions are going to be about eviction, the consequences of eviction, sociology and economics, that sort of thing, and then also Desmond's final argument in the in the end of the book. So uh, question two is a select all that apply questions. You can select as many of these as you want. Um, and the question is, which of the following are consequences of forced moves that Desmond um, uh, documents, right? Um, so psychological problems. Yep. Moving from poorer, moving to poorer neighborhoods with more crime. This was the cent This was one of the main results of the article by uh, Desmond and Schulenberger. Right. They documented that one in eight people in Milwaukee had, had experienced a forced move, and that people who experienced a forced move were more likely to move into a poorer neighborhood with more crime. Once you're evicted, it's harder to find another apartment. That This is the whole background check thing. Job loss. Yep, that was Desmond and Gershenshin's um, finding. 
Neighborhood instability. We saw this with the Hingstons. They were anchors of their original neighborhood. They, they really held the, the, the neighborhood together socially, but after they were evicted, they um, ceased to have those ties to the neighborhood. Right. One of the th other things that we see in um, uh, modules 5 through 15, or 10 through 15 in the last third of the book is the fact that there are just all these harmful feedback cycles associated with eviction um, that drive people into poverty and lock them into poverty. And not just poverty, but what um, Desmond refers to as grinding poverty as opposed to stable poverty. Um, that this is the sort of um, bad economic situation you're in where you don't even have the stability to um, get a hold of yourself. And that's just, this is pretty much what families like Arlene, Arlene's are experiencing. So what kind of harm uh, uh, feedback cycles are we, are we talking about? Well, I've got an exercise where I ask you to name some. Um, and on the review sheet, I name some. I uh, Right now, I'm just going to go off the top of my head and, and think about things that we've read about. So one of the results from Gersension, uh, Desmond and Gersension, was that um, uh, uh, so eviction leads to job loss, loss, and job loss leads to eviction. So this is this is what I mean by a harmful feedback cycle. In case that isn't clear from the exercise. Um, you've got two things that cause each other. So it's well, it, it, it's easy to understand how job loss leads to eviction, right? You lose your job and then you don't can't pay your rent, so you're evicted. But the reverse is also true. Um, once you are evicted, it's harder. You might move to another neighborhood. It might be harder for you to get transportation. Your um, life is upended and that can actually lead to job loss. So you get this reciprocal cycle um, where one where two bad things reinforce each other. Um, another one that was uh, the topic of this chapter, Lobster on Food Stamps. Um, it was also, I think, nicely captured in an essay that I think I linked to um, called uh, If Every Day is a Rainy Day, What Am I Saving For? Uh, so here's the idea. Basically, um, poverty um, leads to spending money recklessly. Um, the point being, people always say, oh, God, if, they, if, if the poor just saved more, you would be fine. Um, but in fact, the whole psychological situation of poverty, including just the utter instability of it, um, it m drives you to spend money recklessly, right? That um, in, uh, if every day is a rainy day, what am I saving for? They just say, look, um, the odds that I can save my way out of this are minuscule. So why not do what Lorraine does when she gets a uh, little bit of money and have some lobster? Because there's no predictability to the future and you need to enjoy it. You need to have some satisfaction in the now. But on the other hand, reckless spending, um, it, it is true that um, if you save less, you're more likely to stay in poverty. Um, Desmond emphasizes strongly that the one of these arrows, uh, the idea that poverty causes um, uh, re reckless spending, and I don't think that's the phrase he uses, but I'll, I'll go ahead and use it. Poverty causes reckless spending is much stronger than the reverse direction where reckless spending causes poverty. Um, but 
But I mean, so and then after once you get a handle on these, they, it just comes naturally to think about them. Eviction leads to drug use. Drug use leads to eviction. You have two negative things, each of which reinforce the other. And so people, through honestly no fault of their own, get caught up in a feedback cycle, a, a harmful feedback cycle. All right. So this is Desmond's central argument in the epilogue. Let's take a second to do this because I, um, to talk about uh, this. There are two things I'm actually testing you on here. One is uh, on your understanding of Desmond's argument in the epilogue. The other is the, your understanding of argument in general. So if you go over to, um, go back all the way to video five on the basics of argument, we, um, and the exercises that came with that, you spent some time putting arguments in standard form. Let me switch, slip down to the PowerPoint slide. So this was the example that I gave then. Imagine you're playing a game of Clue and you uh, reach the conclusion that the murder weapon was the candlestick. And you do this by identifying all the possible murder weapons and then the, uh, uh, and then ruling them out. So it's process of elimination, which is a standard, completely basic form of reasoning. Um, but when we write it in standard form or canonical form like this, we just, we separate out premises and conclusions. So um, the list of possible weapons is one premise. We mark it P1. Uh, P2 and P3 are the premises that rule out other possible weapons. And then your conclusion is that the murder weapon was the candlestick. <sighs> okay. Um, so what's going on here with this argument? Let's read the passage. We've affirmed provision in old age, 12 years of education, and basic nutrition to be the right of every citizen because we have recognized that human dignity depends on the fulfillment of these fundamental needs. And it is hard to argue that housing is not a fundamental need. Decent, affordable housing should be a basic right for everyone in this country. The reason is simple. Without stable shelter, everything else falls apart. So there are a lot of different ways, actually, you can analyze this argument. But the most important thing to see right away is what the conclusion is. Decent, affordable housing should be a basic right for everyone in this country. So we go down here, we write this as the conclusion, right? And I'm just cutting and pasting here. That's fine for you to do as well. If that's the conclusion, then everything else is the premise. So there's our little line that separates the premises and the conclusions. Um, he's got this indicator phrase. The reason is simple. Without affordable shelter, everything else falls apart. Let's go ahead and mark this as an indicator phrase. Oops, the reason is simple. All right, um, so that says that what follows it is, a, is the reason. So that's gonna be one basic premise. Without stable shelter, everything else falls apart. And honestly, just that one premise and that one conclusion would be a fair analysis of this passage. I'd give you full credit for that. Um, but let's go ahead and put in the other stuff too. P2, um, we have affirmed other things as rights because they are, necess they are basic human needs. So what I'm doing in that, with that P2 is I'm paraphrasing what's going on in the um, first, uh, first sentence here. And if you wanted to cut and paste, that would be fine, but I think the paraphrase frames it better. Um, P3, housing is a basic human need. 
so that's a very complete answer. The point is that when you get a passage like this, you're, you're, the, what you need to do is separate out the premises and the, con and the conclusion. Write the premises on separate lines and number them. Then draw a horizontal line and write the conclusion. Put any indicator words separately. There will be a second question about this in a bit. But in the meantime, uh, let's take a look at these. All right. Um, which of the following are ways Desmond has suggested we should secure our right to housing? Large government housing projects. No, actually, he says not because um, the uh, uh, we've seen that large gut large um, like high-rise apartment um, public housing has failed. Guaranteed legal representation for tenants in eviction court. Yes. Seizing property from landlords and redistributing it to the poor. No, he doesn't say this. And I, this is something that I'm going to emphasize when I do the final video. What he's proposing here is not communism. Communism would be seizing property from landlords and redistributing it to the poor. But that is not... Um, uh, that's not something that he, he proposes. This is, this is actually a fairly moderate proposal. And the core of it is this next item here, universal housing vouchers. And the last item that Desmond mentions about uh, that will actually uh, help improve the, uh, help us secure our right to housing is updating building codes. And this one's a little bit surprising because it's, um, uh, kind of pro-landlord. But what he says is, some building codes, this is on page 310, some building codes are critical to maintaining safe and decent housing, others far less so. Enforcing a strict building code in apartments where voucher holders live can be an unnecessary burden on landlords and drive up costs. So, um, this is, and this is something he talks about earlier as well. He says that, uh, um, Milwaukee's dilapidated housing stock, uh, none of it's up to code. Um, and he actually is suggesting um, revising the code to focus on what is actually necessary for safe and decent housing. All right. Number six, children and eviction. Um, which of the following are true? Um, Landlords still openly discriminate against families with children, even though it has been illegal since 1976. True. Fathers with children tend to have it easier than mothers. Yeah, this is a thing that he mentions. It's an odd reverse effect, um, bit of intersectionality there. Um, landlords specialize in renting to families with children? No. Um, landlords who have children themselves are less likely to evict families with children? No. Families with children are more likely to be evicted. Yes. All right. Um, so that's the end of the section on uh, facts about eviction from Desmond. Okay. So next up, which of the uh, are two questions taken from the section on argument. So again, to, to remember this stuff, you need to go back to video um, five in week two, where I talk about putting arguments in canonical form. I also have the definition of argument, which, which is there. Also, the definition of statement is going to be important. You're going to have to identify statements, which is something that you did in this exercise here. All right, so uh, which of the following are true of an argument um, as the term is used in philosophy, logic, and critical thinking? I say philosophy, logic, and critical thinking there because this is uh, actually, because those are all courses I teach. And I, you, I talk about argument in every course I teach because it is ultimately the core thing that I am trying to drive home um, to help you be a better critical thinker, a better reasoner. Um, so, um, basically, an argument attempts to convince someone of a statement, and arguments are composed of statements. Arguments are statements you use to support other statements. All right. 
Now imagine the next one is another uh, put an argument in standard form question. It's pulled from a bank of arguments uh, that a uh, bank of passages that I can use in any test. So you're not just going to get ethics tests or not just tests about passages about evictions. Um, so here's one that's just a made up example about biology. So you imagine a scientist is looking at an elephant. Well, call call her Alice. She has thick gray skin, long, long trunk and big tusks, um, two finger like projections, weighs 5,000 pounds. Uh, I conclude that Alice is probably an African and not an Asian elephant. So Alice is an African and not an Asian elephant is your conclusion. I conclude that is your indicator phrase. And then everything else is a premise. Um, and this time I'm going to be lazy um, and just cut and paste and then break them up into premises. So P1. P2. And then uh, for P3, I need to say P3. Alice, God damn it. Alice weighs about 3,000 pounds. And I'm doing it like this because one of the things that I try to emphasize is that arguments are always composed of statements. Statements, so when you put arguments in canonical form, they need to be um, complete sentences. And here's our little line. And the formatting of this is off because it doesn't let you adjust the spacing very easily, but I'm not going to worry about it. I'll take it all out of italics, though. Okay. The last two questions are from the video on exploitation. Um, as I explained in the video, uh, Desmond concludes by talking about exploitation as the missing element that people haven't been talking about in the poverty debate. Um, and uh, so I wanted to give you an account of exploitation. It's a little bit different than the one that was we saw earlier in the um, uh, earlier in the course from Iris Marion Young. This one's from Alan Wertheimer. It's more useful for us, among other things, because it uh, is um, allows you to talk about exploitation in individual situations, whereas Iris Marianne Young only talks about relationships between groups. Okay, so two important ideas that um, are talked about in that video. Here, I'll just show, show you the screenshots for it. So this is video 24, exploitation. This is the quote I open with. Exploitation, now there's a word that's been scrubbed out of the poverty debate. Um, and then a lot of these terms are defined in it. Um, so unconscionable contract, you can find that in there, I'm not gonna bother looking for it. An unconscionable contract is a thing that exists in law. It is a contract that is so unfair the government will not enforce it, right? Um, and there's a long tradition actually going back to English common law that says certain contracts are um, just uh, unenforceable. Another important thing that uh, we talk about in that video and Wertheimer talks about is the difference between moral weight and moral force. An important distinction here is that sometimes, sometimes things are wrong. Things are wrong morally, but for various reasons in a pluralist society, um, we uh, the government cannot use coercive force to prevent it. And so it may be, for instance, uh, one of the things that Wertheimer suggests is that there are cases of exploitation that are actually wrong, but it's not the government's job to stop them, 
or in fact, it's not anyone's job to stop them using coercive force. He doesn't specify which ones, but this is, an, uh, this is a thing that he wants to leave open. If you want to understand more about things that are wrong, but you can't, um, you're not obligated to stop, you'll, you're going to have to watch the video. I've got an example there. But in any case, moral weight is just how wrong something is. How, something like exploitation. Now, something might be really exploitative, it might be a little bit exploitive. Moral force is how obligated, obligated we are to intervene to stop something. And it just may be the case that, um, and look, I've got 18 words, that's enough. It may be the case that there are things that are wrong that we just have to, that aren't really our business. Um, and on the other hand, it may be that there are things that are wrong that are our business, and they both have moral weight and moral force. Um, but all of this is talked about in the video. And so it's a half hour video. It explains enough of the concepts for you to get these two, uh, the two last questions on the test. Um, and those are, uh, for the real test, those will be pulled randomly from a pool. Okay, um, that's the walkthrough. Good luck.